It's preparing. Okay. Setting up the meeting. Mine says that we're live. Yeah, it just sets it up. Okay, here we go. Okay, hello everyone. This is Meryl with Akron Soul Train. And tonight I'm here with resident artist Marian Bennett and our special guest, Chris Klein, the founder and director of the Butterfly Ridge Butterfly Conservation Center in Hawking Hills. We are here to learn more about moths and the nighttime pollinators that influenced so much of Miriam's current exhibit at the Akron Soul Train Gallery that's called Akron in Wonderland Nocturnes, which will be on view until May 29th. The gallery is open Wednesday through Saturday from 11 to 4 p.m. with special extended hours Friday, May 28th until 7 p.m. Akron Soul Train is an artist residency program connecting and empowering the community and artists by granting fellowships that provide resources for all creative disciplines to foster a more vibrant Akron. Please feel free to comment below with any questions or thoughts and we will get to them during and at the end depending on how the conversation is going. Also, please comment on any of our videos on Facebook or Instagram um, whether you enjoy this type of virtual programming, as we want to keep putting out our best thoughtful and creative programming for everyone to enjoy. Before we get going, I'd like to thank Akron Soul Train's sponsors for their continued support, the GAR Foundation, the Akron Community Foundation, the Ohio Arts Council, Leonard Family Foundation, the Brennan Family Foundation, the Knight Foundation, and the Char and Chuck Fowler Family Foundation. Okay, so we're gonna have Miriam and Chris introduce themselves really quick. And then we'll start with Miriam and also say kind of what got you so interested in these nighttime pollinators during your residency. Okay, well, hi everyone. Thanks for joining the live stream. So um, yeah, I mean, during the residency, I should say, um, I really took the directive from Akron Soul Train, literally where they said, create a new body of work. So I started with nothing um, in terms of thinking about what I was going to do for my installation. And I just started working um, and then the pandemic hit. So um, I had had this idea that I was going to move in and all these sort of more, I guess like urban spaces within uh, Akron and sort of discover these sort of in-between places where really interesting things were happening. Um, but then with the pandemic, all of these spaces I wanted to go linger in, such as libraries and movie theaters and jazz clubs and, and places like that um, were closed. And so I ended up going out into the natural areas around Akron and became kind of transfixed by all the insect life. Um, I would find you know, a caterpillar that looked like some kind of outer space creature. And I found this app called inaturalist.com that you could, you could try to identify it through pictures on there. And then you could like say, I think it's this, you know, and then people would tell you like, yes, confirm, confirmed. Um, and I realized that you can kind of map out some of the insects in your environment um, that way and start to learn about them. And then <laughs> I, so I, so that was, that became like, then it just like, started bubbling up in my imagination with all the other things I'm perpetually interested in, such as um, sort of surrealism and dreams and things that that kind of come to you in a sort of fragmented way, but perhaps built, form a story. Um, and I was really enamored of the fact that we have all these night pollinating moths that are incredibly beautiful, just sort of feats of natural engineering. And, and we don't think about them because they do their work at night in the dark while we're sleeping because we're not nocturnal creatures even though some of us probably feel like we are sometimes. Mm -hmm. So that that was that and the dreams that everyone's been writing down and contributing um, both before the residency and now in the gallery itself were two big prompts the night pollinating insects and the and the dreams and then anyways I became so interested in talking to somebody who really knew something about you know, moths and insects that I was, I asked if we could do this 
uh, with Chris Klein uh, since he's made, uh, I don't know, almost a life's work around um, the study of these. And his own story is like, it seems very fascinating to me because I think he drove across the country on his motorcycle searching for butterflies. Twice. Uh, <laughs> twice. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. So this is Chris. I'm so happy that you're joining us. Well, thank you. Yeah, Chris, can you um, introduce yourself real quick and kind of tell us how Butterfly Ridge came about? Sure. Uh, once again, I'm Chris Klein. I'm the director of Butterfly Ridge. Uh, we are in the Hocking Hills. If you're familiar with the Hocking Hills, we are about halfway between Rock House State Park and Conkles Hollow on that same stretch of road there. Um, how Butterfly Ridge came about? Well, there were two, two main driving factors. Number one, my dad gifted me five acres of land. And number two, I was tired of driving to Columbus to work every day. And so um, my wife and I got to thinking about, you know, what could we do with our five acres that would be meaningful and, and fulfilling. And um, well, we, I, I knew how to do butterflies because many of my past jobs had ended up revolving around butterflies. And, um, and then kind of a, a weird series of events happened uh, my brother wanted to sell his five acres, so we bought him out. And then after my mom passed away, my dad wanted to take her name off of the deed of the remaining 11 acres, and he gave it to me. And so really, with pretty much no effort on my part, the project, you know, other than driving dad to the lawyers, um, the project grew from five acres to 21 acres, and with as much cash as we needed. So, uh, so that's kind of how Butterfly Ridge came about. We, um, we have a variety of different habitats that we've tinkered with to make them more appealing to butterflies and other pollinators, in including moths. Uh, we've got about one mile trail that traverses through those different habitats. Um, how, how, just real briefly, how I got involved with moths, that actually dates back to, uh, Oh, around 2005, and I had the uh, the honor of um, being invited to do some mothing with Dr. Bruce Walsh of the University of Arizona, and he sort of introduced me to all of it. And then I've I've been very blessed to to have some moth nerd friends who have kind of nurtured me along as well. And one of one of those friends, Diane Brooks, she now has me hooked on what are called the micro moths which are moths that, you know, from head to tail are barely a quarter of an inch long. So, uh, so you know, it, it's, it's quite a, a diverse area here at Butterfly Ridge. So far, we've documented about 775 species of moths in the last five years. Wow. Yeah, and I, I should mention that, um, that one of your books that I bought on the internet before I found your actual site is called the Moths of Butterfly Ridge. Uh -huh. And it's sort of a, it's not entirely comprehensive, but it's a lot of them uh, listed with, a, with an image and with a description. And um, so that was really helpful to me. And I ended up also including micro moths in my exhibition. So oh, very cool. you know, sometimes people come into the gallery and they don't really see the moth drawings right away, but I've tried to draw everything to scale. And I really <laughs> love that because some of them are like, there's like a frame and you're like, there's nothing in this frame. And then there's like this teeny tiny like micro moth. Suddenly they see a piece of lint in the frame there. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So. so what's kind of new with the study of moths and night pollinators and kind of how important they are. Is that like new research being found on things like that? Well, my understanding, um, moth research is, is really kind of limited and usually um, it's what we would call agricultural pests that, that seem to get most of the attention in the moth world. I've actually told several, because um, we, we hire college interns during the summer at our place, and I've told several of our interns after they've left that if, if they wanted to 
to earn a living, you know, uh, you know, with some job security, they should uh, get a PhD in micro moth taxonomy. Because for example, here at Butterfly Ridge, we have photographed, I can't tell you how many of micro moths that have yet to be described by the scientific community. So yeah, I mean, if somebody wants job security, go into the micro moth business and I can pretty much guarantee it. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's totally fascinating the way I came across the research. I mean, you know, because I'm just a person sort of finding this randomly without realizing I'm looking for it. And I was reading this book, The Sensual, <laughs> the Sensual Garden. Um, and then I got to the chapter on night blooming flowers. And then that chapter starts talking about the pollinators that pollinate the night blooming flowers and that they're understudied as far as like what this Ken Drews is mentioning in this book, that they really haven't been thoroughly investigated in the same manner. And it makes sense because if we think about them as only in relation to humans and only in relation to, oh, are they eating my crops or not? Or are they eating my, my sweater? You know, I think, which I think is like one species of moth, you know, of all the species that actually will do that. Then you just don't even see them. They're like these beings all around us doing tons of work that, intersects with our lives, but we don't know all the connections. And uh, I read one study in Great Britain, which I can probably share, uh, Meryl, in the comments later uh, that people can link to, where they had done a pretty comprehensive study around this one lake. But I think there's so much uh, more to be discovered, and I didn't find this much research in North America. So maybe I should try to go for a PhD in micro moth taxonomy. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> quit my job as a film professor <laughs> yeah. and once again to anyone um, tuning in please feel free to leave any questions about moss or other night pollinators in the comments um, how can we maybe help moths and other night pollinators out like what can we plant um, you mentioned like you've been taking pictures of, of moths that aren't really studied yet. Can, can anyone do that? Um, well, you know, there, there's different levels of, of moth nerddom, I think. Um, <laughs> a lot of people just get started by looking at um, the moths. I think that we she... might have lost. Oh. Oh. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. I hear you. <laughs> Can you hear us, Meryl? I guess not. Okay, sorry, my internet oh. connection just She's back. flipped out a little bit, but I think we're back. <laughs> okay. Well, now would be a good time okay. to announce the giveaway because it's a natural connection to your question on how can I attract moths. <laughs> yeah. yeah um, the, the, answer that question first. Um, you know, a lot of people just start with looking at what comes to the porch light, you know, um, and, and you get a, a fair amount of activity at your porch light, depending on where you're located. Uh, if you're located near a forest, then you're probably going to get a lot more or maybe like a field that, that's got trees starting to move into it and whatnot. Um, what we do here at Butterfly Ridge, we could, we sort of take it to another level uh, in that we've got scattered throughout the property, we've got what looks kind of like wooden goalposts. And uh, we hang a white sheet in the middle of the goalpost, a high powered mercury vapor light on one side of the crossbar and an ultraviolet light on the other side. And we power it all with a little uh, portable Honda generator. And we will stay up until midnight, one in the morning, because what happens, the bright lights attract moths to the white sheet. And so that's, that's how we get a lot of the, the photographs that we get. But when you, when you talk specifically about pollinators and, and moths pollinating duties, the one plant that we've noticed that just really pulls the moths in and that is common milkweed. Um, we've got a, a nice patch of common milkweed pretty close to our nature center. 
And I mean, if you go, when the, when the milkweed's blooming, if you go out there, those flower heads are just covered with different moths. So, um, so I think common milkweed's always a really strong choice to, to provide some nectar resources for the moths. And then trees, trees are really valuable because most moth species or what I call generalists, meaning they'll eat multiple things as caterpillars, but frequently those multiple things that they will eat are different tree species. Um, so for example, luna moths, for example, they'll eat oak, they'll eat hickory, uh, they'll eat uh, ash, I think it is. Um, they'll eat a wide variety of things. So once again, you know, having a, a nice supply of nearby forest is really super helpful as well. Yeah, I was going to ask, so the milkweed, isn't that, you said the moths are generalists, uh, meaning that they don't stick to one plant um, to necessarily like put their eggs down. They'll right. eat, when they're in the caterpillar stage, that's when they are eating a lot, um, but also milkweed is versus like the uh, monarchs, which are not generalists, right? Right, monarchs use milkweed specifically as their caterpillar host plant and they only use milkweed, um, but lots of butterflies, different kinds of butterflies and moths will visit the milkweed flowers uh, as a source of nectar, you know, for, for the adult moths to feed and, and the adult butterflies. Yeah, the caterpillars, uh, yeah, the monarch, I mean, they're exclusively milkweed feeders and their population's been in a fairly si significant decline here in the last 15, 20 years. So yeah, I mean, planting more milkweed is always gonna help them too. Milk, milkweed's a good plant. And I, I call it a twofer. Okay, because some things use it as a caterpillar host plant, other things um, feed on the nectar in the flowers. Uh, so milkweed's always a strong choice for almost anybody. So do the caterpillars then, I mean, so when they plant their eggs, I, I don't even know the right terminology, but when they, do, do moths lay eggs? Do you say they lay oh. eggs? Deposit? <laughs> okay, so when they lay their eggs, I would imagine they lay their eggs somewhere where they know the caterpillars are going to be able to eat? Usually, yes, but I'll be honest, moths, um, how do I put this tactfully? Uh, moth females are known to lay their eggs pretty much anywhere. Um, believe it or not, I've had eggs laid on me um, <laughs> just because that's what they do, you know, when, when they're ready to pop, then they're, they're popping them out regardless of where they are. So once again, that's why it's good if, if you have uh, some of that forest nearby so that they don't have to go far before they can satisfy those urges, so to speak. And, and do, they, do they lay all their eggs at once or is it like a period of time that they're... Moths typically will lay several eggs in a batch. Um, and cause frequently different butterflies, um, a lot of them will maybe lay one egg on a leaf and then move to another leaf and lay a egg and move on to another leaf and lay an egg. See moths frequently don't work that way. I, I've seen, you know, 30, 40 moth eggs all in the same little cluster. Um, and then something to keep in mind, the, especially the big silk moths, so like the Cecropias and the Lunas and the Promethea moths, they have an extremely limited adult life expectancy. Um, those, those adult silk moths, they'll live for a week at the most. Um, Cause see, they, the, the big, big silk moths, technically, I guess we can't re really refer to them as pollinators. They don't have actual functioning mouth parts. So during their adulthood, they're totally living off of fat stored from when they were a caterpillar. But a lot of the smaller moths abs absolutely provide pollination services. Yeah, that was something I wondered about because I was reading how that I found that when you were talking about them depositing their their eggs 
I have, there's this other, um, so Maria Sibylla Marion, who is a, uh, who did the insects of Suriname, she has this great illustration of this, I don't know if you guys can see this, of a, um, I don't remember what kind of moth that is, but you can see the female is just squirting out all the eggs <laughs> yeah. in the illustration. <laughs> And, oh, yeah. she just, and that was one of the innovations she did in the arts and in the science. I mean, she really approached it more as a scientific description, but she observed them in life and drew them in life as opposed mm -hmm. to the predominant way of describing insects through drawing at the time, which was, you know, dead ones that were dissected and sort of drawn from different angles. But what she brought to the, to the art world and to the scientific world was direct observation and then drawing. And she drew them in all life, all parts of their life stages mm -hmm. and um, and the plants too. So it's this really interesting uh, resource and something that I sort of try to mimic in my own practice when trying to understand them. But your, to your point about them not having mouth parts and then maybe not being pollinators, uh, what I was also reading is that moths are kind of they, they're kind of dirty, like they don't really like some of them, they don't really clean themselves after they go from one flower to another. And because they're not specific to a specific species, they, I guess they're still, that would still be the ones that have mouth parts and are actually trying to get nectar. Right, although I can see how maybe a, a luna moth by accident could end up spreading pollen from one flower to another. Because typically moths, one of the ways they differ from butterflies uh, if you look at the body of a butterfly, they tend to be very sleek and smooth, whereas moth bodies tend to be really big and bulky and heavy and, and hairy. Mm -hmm. So any flower that they brush up against, that pollen is going to absolutely get hung up in all those hairs. So, you know, there, I, so like I said, there's a chance that maybe some of those big guys could pollinate things, you know, by accident sort of. Yeah, I think that's what I was reading in one of the sort of science, in that observational science, maybe it was the one from Great Britain, is that they just kind of observed, you know, where did these moths go and which ones preened themselves like meticulously after doing something like bees will do that. Bees uh -huh. will preen themselves a lot. So they're pollinating, but they're not, they're doing it on, and they fly in a bee line uh, too, versus the moths, they just don't care. So they're just like, you know, spreading things randomly. Um, anyways, I liked that idea too. Um, even though that's one of the things that I think is off-putting for people is how hairy they are and kind of yeah. scary looking they are. Yeah. But I wonder why we have that reaction. Well, I think lots of times it's with things we don't understand. You know, I mean, people are kind of that way with snakes as well. I mean, a lot of people think snakes have slimy bodies, which mm -hmm. they absolutely do not. And I think a lot of it's just, we just don't understand them. You know, the, the layman doesn't really understand those sorts of things. Um, you know, like mm, rattlesnakes, for example, I know people who think, you know, if you get 10 within 10 feet of a rattlesnake, they're going to bite you. Whereas I can't begin to guess how many rattlesnakes I've encountered in my life and I've yet to be bitten. So, um, you know, sometimes you just gotta get out there and get your hands wet and check things out and learn about things. Okay, we do have a couple of questions so far. We wanna kind of get to those. Um, Daniel, he's asked multiple questions here. Um, what part of the trees do the moths eat? Um, they typically are eating leaves. Um, occasionally they may eat flowers, but normally they're eating leaves. The, the caterpillar form are. Okay. Ooh, this one's really interesting. This is a great question. Um, Chris, are you seeing a change in dominant population numbers at Butterfly Ridge since you founded it due to climate change? Um, with moths, not so much. And I think that's in part cause our, our data is somewhat limited. Um, I, I started very much a novice. So I, I didn't really know much going into it. Now, butterflies, on the other hand, 
Um, one of the things that we're seeing with butterflies is that some species that were typically considered more southern. So for example, I like to use cloudless sulfur as an example. It's a big yellow butterfly. Uh, used to be like in the Columbus area, you rarely saw cloudless sulfurs. If you wanted to see those, you went down along the Ohio River. Now, um, we regularly get cloudless sulfurs at our place. Uh, if you go the right time of year up to Columbus, like Blendon Woods Metro Park or something, I mean, they're going to be all over the place. So we, we are seeing butterfly ranges moving north. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that's a climate change thing. I'm, I'm not so sure about how moths uh, are fitting into that just because there's, there's so many of them. I haven't really learned their ranges very well yet. Mm -hmm. And then his next question was um, one that I also have. Why are moths drawn to light sources? <laughs> Do we know? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm hoping maybe Miriam found something out because uh, I'm at a loss for answering that one. So. <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, I did read something and I can't remember what it was. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but yeah, it didn't seem to, it, what I, I, I recall is that there was no sort of definitive agreed upon answer, mm -hmm. um, which is really interesting uh, as well. Um, so it's another mystery for us to, you know, explore. There's got to be a reason. It's so strange. <laughs> Except I will tell you, I should put the dog somewhere. Come here. Um, that when, okay, so I was just admitting before we got on the call that I did a thing and I wasn't sure it was something that was supposed to be done, which is I ordered moth cocoons off of eBay because I wanted to see, I wanted to, I just wanted them and I wanted to see if they would hatch, which they did. And the first thing that the moth did after it, I knew I was supposed to put it at the, you know, give it some sticks and I put it at the base of like a ficus tree in my house and it kind of climbed up, sat there for a few days while its wing was, wings were filling up with the meconium so that they become stiff and are able to fly. And um, the first place it flew to was a window in the stairs, um, which was, would have been a light source. So mm -hmm. it could just be a survival thing, you know, when they first emerge, if they're in a dark area, maybe they need to go to the light, but why would they do that? Because it's nighttime. Yeah. Well, there goes know, but <laughs> if I can throw another thing in to, you know, throw another monkey wrench into this, I mean, when we set up our mothing sheets at night, we get a whole lot more stuff other than moths. Um, I mean, our sheets are loaded with leaf hoppers and tree hoppers and different kinds of flies and owl flies and crane flies and dobson fly, all this stuff. So it, it seems like it's not just moths that are attracted to the light. It's lots of different insects that, that go to light as well. There's a, there's a lot of moths, I think, that don't look like moths or we don't like the clear wing. Some of those clear wing ones oh, look yeah. like Flies, but I understand those are actually moths as well. So yeah, um, the clear wing moths are just incredibly cool bugs. Um, the, my, my very first experience with them, I was working at a as a naturalist in Muncie, Indiana, and a woman came running into the nature center um, saying that she had just seen a cross between a bumblebee and a hummingbird and, and wanted to know more about it. And, of course, my first thought was, well, I'm not sure that that's biologically possible, but I'll, I'll go take a look at what you saw, you know. And, um, and sure enough, it was the snowberry clearwing moth. Um, and, you know, and when, when people, when I talk to people about moths and then they make the comment how moths are, are nocturnal, well, there are some, actually, there's quite a few exceptions to that rule, and, and the clearwing moths are probably one of the one of the best exceptions to that rule. Yeah, I actually have a drawing of a hummingbird clearwing moth in the capsule in the in the parlor room, as I call it, in the gallery. Cool. And because it was, I wasn't sure because I was doing them in watercolor. That one I actually just left in pencil, um, just because it was a clearwing. So I could, <laughs> it was like I don't have to color it in. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I thought about it because I was like, well, I think it's actually diurnal, but. 
I'm going to add it to the night pollinators and no, I don't know. <laughs> but now you just blew it. Now everybody knows. <laughs> That's okay. People can dream during the day. It's true. Okay, good. Thank you, Meryl. <laughs> no, that's so interesting that there's so much um, variety. And I love that there's kind of still questions about why they're attracted to light or why they do certain things. Because it just shows that there are so many things that we don't know. Mm -hmm. But culturally, I think that's what people kind of associate moths with. Like that if they know anything about a moth, they know that they go to the light. But that's so interesting that we don't have a very clear explanation why. <laughs> I love that. Okay. Any other questions? Get them into the comments now. Um, Miriam, do you want to talk about the giveaway? Yes, you could tell I wanted. Yeah, so I promised, I did a quick Instagram live right before this, promising another Insta uh, giveaway. And Chris offered threw something into the giveaway too. So I guess, what do they do, Meryl? They comment in the, they comment like me or I'm in or something. Yeah. Just comment um, if you want to be involved in the giveaway um, and, and we'll pick from, from one of those comments. So I'm going to give away something from the exhibition and the person can tell me what they want. They can choose. I have um, one of the moths I became very enamored with was the unexpected Sycnia moth. Mm -hmm. And I just loved its name and I liked its shape and it wasn't a micro moth. So it was a little bit easier to draw. And I ended up make, started to embroider them on um, these, these sort of sheer handkerchiefs that I was you know, adding to the parlor. So if you would like a, uh, that would be one choice. And another choice would be a cyanotype, um, which is another, I do have some, maybe I could, I have some Luna moth wings that are done in cyanotype um, or a, or that animal skull that I found when I was walking around that's in the curio cabinet. I don't know, I think it might be a possum, um, but it's, so those are the, my giveaways and Chris can tell about his giveaway. Sure, I'm, I'm throwing into the pot there um, a book that we published uh, last year. It's called, If You Plant It, They Will Come, a butterfly habitat success story. And basically it documents the first five years of Butterfly Ridge, um, explains in just disgustingly detailed narrative uh, how exactly we tinkered with all the habitat and also lots and lots of data about um, butterfly sightings. So for example, just real quick, at the beginning of every month from April through October, we walk a transect. Uh, basically we walk certain sections of our trail and we document every single butterfly that we see. And we've been doing that since April, 2015, uh, actually before we even started tinkering with habitat. And so all that data is also in that if you plant it, they will come book so that people can see firsthand that I'm not making this stuff up, that, that what we've done is actually working. I mean, we have quadrupled our butterfly population here in five years. And basically we put all of our secrets in this book and people can recreate it at their own place and make their own butterflies, so to speak. So for those of us who live in cities and we just have maybe a little tiny uh, yard or something, I know you mentioned it would be important to be kind of near something like a forest or something like that. Um, but is there any uh, thoughts on that? I know it, my neighbor down the street, even though they have a little tiny uh, yard and it's like actually on a hill, they planted a ton of milkweed. <laughs> and uh, I actually took some of it and I put it in the gallery. So there's <laughs> <laughs> some milkweed seeds in the parlor room now as well. But is that um, maybe, is would you say, plant milkweed or are there certain things that maybe do well in an urban environment? I know we see moths in the urban environment. Right. So. I, I would say if you're looking to attract moths, I would plant as wide of a diversity of plants as you can. Um, because, I mean, for example, when, when we moth light in more enforced areas, we, we get a different collection of moths on the sheet than what we get when we light out in the middle of the prairie. Um, 
Now, I'll be honest, out in the middle of the prairie, we, we tend to get more of the micros, but, um, you know, there, there are so many different host plants that they have. I mean, asters and goldenrods and different grasses and, and milkweeds, and, and sometimes it's just really random stuff, like, for example, dandelions. I mean, there's half a dozen moth species that use dandelion as a caterpillar host plant. So um, I use that as my plug to try to convince people to not kill the dandelions in their lawns because they, they actually serve a, a considerable function as far as pollinators are concerned. So yeah, I would just say as many different things as you have space for. Um, and if that's 10 different things, great. If it's 200 different things, well, that's great too. So. Okay, Miriam, we have a, a question for you real quick, actually. And once again, comment um, in that in the chat, in the comment section, if you want to be part of the giveaway and win um, the, a piece from the installation and the book. Um, Miriam, of, your, of the installation, now it's very immersive. If, you have, if you're tuning in, you haven't gotten a chance to come down to Akron Soul Train and you can before um, May 29th, please try to do so. It does, it's really beautiful in person. It needs to be experienced. We also have a um, walkthrough that's posted on Facebook on our page. So you can watch um, Miriam and I go through it there. But of your pieces in the installation, what are you most excited or surprised by? What am I most excited or surprised by? Yeah. Oh, well, it would definitely be the dream letters that people are writing me at the front of the, a couple things surprised me. One, that my cocoons hatched and the moths flew out. Because <laughs> I had originally thought I would put those in that cabinet in the gallery. And then I got worried that maybe it had mothballs in it at one point or, you know, where would I, how would I release them? So I took them home and then they hatched in my house. Um, but what has surprised me most and delighted me most is the interaction from people coming in and becoming accustomed to the space and then I'm not in there all the time but I'm in there often enough that I usually see a different person each time I'm there and uh, people will just start sharing their dreams or they'll remember a dream they they forgot that they'd had and then all the dreams that have been written in on the provided paper and put into the provided cyanotype printed uh, envelopes into the dream mailboxes that's been uh, surprising and and uh, really great for me because it's kind of like how Akron Soul Train tells you you have to do something totally new that you haven't done before, a new body of work. And now these dreams are because I decided that was what I had to use. And Annie Morgan, the dancer that I worked with, you know, also, you know, she did her choreography all based on both night pollinators, which is super cool because she was like observing these insects and then doing um, some of these dances. And then later, as the dream started coming in, doing movements based on the dream. So it's a kind of a way for me of letting go of my preconceptions of what might make a good piece of art or what might make an interesting piece of art and allowing uh, the sort of idea of the individual to kind of give way to the idea of we're all part of a sort of both natural world and also maybe a supernatural world or a surreal world. It, to me, it all kind of like blends together and the dream narratives are just amazing. Um, and so full of interconnections with the natural world as well. A dream that was left today that I put a picture on my Instagram was a dream uh, that my mother remembered. I first, she said, I don't remember any of my dreams. I don't know, man, I don't know what I did. And I was like, well, you gotta think of something. What about when you were a kid? She's like, oh, I had a dream. And I was like, write it down, write it down. And so she did and I read it. And it was that um, she was being chased by wolves and the only way to get away from the wolves was to swing higher and higher, you know, on this swing until, and then I stopped. That's when I took the picture of what she was writing. So I don't know the answer to what happens <laughs> in her dream. I'll read it later. She put it in the mailbox. Mm -hmm. So that is what was most um, surprising was that it actually worked, that my idea actually worked and people are, are doing this. We're creating a collaborative text with these with these dream narratives 
and and music. People are giving music and people are giving um, for the mixtape uh, and people are giving um, drawings. So. Okay, and Daniel um, just left another comment about how his one block long street has a self-designated um, pollinator path and a lot of our tree lawns, AKA double strips if you're in Akron, um, they have a three or four foot square patches that encourage pollination for butterflies and moss. So I did not know that. Thank you so much for that information. And there's a link to how it's expanded um, throughout Cleveland Heights as well. Hmm. So definitely check that out. Um, okay, so Thank you guys so much for your comments and your questions. And Daniel, you had so many amazing comments and questions. I'm going to say that you win the giveaway. <laughs> so um, we can message you on Facebook and um, see how we can get you everything um, probably at towards the end of the show. Okay. And um, real quick, Chris, um, how can, are you guys open this summer? How can people um, find you guys, visit? Yeah, we are open every day but Tuesday um, from 10 until 5. And then um, if you're interested, uh, Saturday nights, June through August, with the exception of the first weekend of the month, we actually have public moth lighting. Um, so like the second, third, fourth Saturdays of June, July, and August. And um, that usually starts at nine o'clock. Uh, something that we did in 2019 that we really enjoyed, we had to put on the back burner last year because of the pandemic, but I think we're gonna try it again is that we usually have uh, live musical performances before the moth lighting. So the music usually starts around 8.30 and then we start to head towards the sheets, 9, 9.15, kind of in that neighborhood. Uh, normally we go to about midnight. Of course, you don't have to stay all the way to midnight. Um, now the hardcore moth nerds, um, on really hot, humid days in July, they actually beg me to stay open until like 1 or 1.30 in the morning because the really super cool stuff tends to come later in the night. But um, but yeah, we love for folks to come uh, visit us. Our admissions, admission fee is $5 a person, so we're, we're real reasonably priced. And once again, um, if you look up, uh, if you Google where Rock House State Park is, uh, we are about two miles south of Rock House State Park on 374. Okay, thank you so much for that information. Um, let's check the comments one more time. Okay, I think we're going to wrap it up. Um, so once again, I'd like to thank Miriam Bennett and Chris Klein for joining us tonight. Um, and I think we, we might need to take a trip this summer <laughs> to see, now that I know that there's the moth lighting, that sounds amazing. Um, once again, Miriam's show, Akron in Wonderland Nocturnes, is currently on view at the Akron Soul Train Gallery at the Burton D. Morgan Exhibition Space in downtown Akron. Um, it will be on view until May 29th. Hours are Wednesday through Saturday from 11 to 4 with special extended hours on Friday, May 28th until seven. And I mentioned before, but if you are not able to see the show in person, we have a virtual walkthrough and gallery talk posted on the Akron Soul Train Facebook and Instagram page. Okay, and I think we're gonna sign off. Thank you all for joining us. We'll see Thank you in the next program. Thank you, Chris. It was great meeting you. Good meeting you ladies. Well.